Well, thank you for everyone for coming out this evening. Um, this is the last in our series of visiting artists that is in conjunction with the Sitter exhibition that's up until the end of the month. Um, if you haven't seen the show, please go see it before it comes down. Um, it's kind of hard to have missed it at this point. It's been up for a while. And uh, it's an honor tonight to be able to introduce Doug Ishar and Kelly Connell uh, to come up and talk about their practices in conversation with one another. And you just saw, or maybe you just walked in at the tail end, of three of Doug Ishar's films that he screened last year at the Whitney Biennial. Doug is um, a mentor of mine. He was actually my thesis advisor back in grad school in 2005, 2007 at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So it's a real huge honor for me to have you here tonight, Doug. Um, you know, I always found that our critiques and time together were extremely insightful and inspirational. You're a wealth of resource and constructive criticism, and I wouldn't be here today without all of your guidance. And when I was first approached by Michael Goodson to co-curate the Sitter exhibition, I really thought of your body of work, Marginal Waters, as being an important component to the exhibition. But I think that your new work that we were able to experience tonight is such a shift and such a treat to see the, the depth of your practice right, and how much it's changed over the years. Since the work that's in the Sitter Show, if, I'm not sure how many of you know, is actually from 1985, uh, much older work. But Doug has been probably exhibiting since the uh, 90s, his work has focused on the potential of video and sound in ever more distilled manifestations. Following the larger multimedia installations such as Orderly in 1994 and Wake in 96, Ishar turned to more minimal arrangements. His 1997 work, In Sight, San Diego, Tijuana, used a high school basketball court as a local for multimedia meditations of adolescent homosexual desire. His 2001 work, Ground, issues 24 channels of sound to replicate the sound of a gallery floor being swept. His 2005 public installation, Water Music, explores the relationship between personal and artistic histories of the Pacific Rim cultures in which Ishar lived as a child. He was actually born in Hawaii. Ishar has taught extensively in Scandinavia as a visiting professor in Malmo. I believe it's pronounced Gothenburg, but I probably got that one wrong. <laughs> um, and was a visiting artist at IASPIS in Stockholm in the spring of 2001. He, he currently teaches as an associate professor of photography at the University of Illinois at Chicago. It's a real pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you for sharing those films with us. Um, the other artist that we have out in conjunction for our discussion this evening is Kelly Connell. Kelly Connell actually also lives and works in Chicago. And I was first introduced to Kelly back after, graduate, after I graduated from UIC. Um, I had the pleasure of being in a crit group. I was totally floored to be a part of this amazing group of contemporary photographers. And um, in part with Brian Ulrich, who we brought out earlier this month. And Brian, I think, at one point whispered to me, it's OK, you never want to be the smartest in the room. <laughs> and I laughed at that. But I learned a lot from being able to be a, a part of their studio critiques. And I think um, both, both Kelly and Doug are so giving and such great professors that it was a really great uh, experience for our undergrads and our grads to be able to have studio visits from them today. So thank you for your time. I'm sure the students grew a lot from our discussions. Kelly's work has been widely received and included in numerous solo and group exhibitions. Her work is in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Columbus Museum of Art, which I just found out today her first solo show was here in Columbus, Ohio at the museum. So welcome back, Kelly. And um, also the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the da Dallas Museum of Art. Her first full-length monograph entitled Kelly Connell, Midwest, or Double Life, was released by Decode Books in 2011. And her publications include um, MP3, which was an amazing set of three books uh, 
kind of bundled together in a beautiful sleeve that was published by the Midwest Photographers Project, which was in conjunction with the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago and Aperture in New York. And um, she also has published with Vitamin PH, New Perspectives in Photography, in London in 2006, that was Biden Press. Photo Art, The New World of Photography by Aperture in 2008. And Autofocus, The Self-Portrait in Contemporary Photography um, in 2010. Her work has been showcased in Adbusters, American Photo Magazine, Art in America, Art News, Camera Work, a journal for photographic arts, uh, Diva Magazine, Exit Express, Foam Magazine, Genti di Fotografia, Girls Like Us, The New York Blade, The New York Times. And her work is represented by Catherine Edelman Gallery in Chicago and Paul Kopkin Gallery in Los Angeles. And again, she lives and works in Columbus, or in, sorry, Chicago, and she teaches at Columbia College in Chicago. And uh, she's going to come up here now and just show um, a few of her images. Her Double Life series that's up in the exhibition of Sitter is just a small fragment of a decade, over a decade long project that she's been working on. And a few of the images in the show are new, and I think were some of, some of the first times they've been shown. So that's also a really an amazing treat and honor to have new work in a group show. So Kelly, uh, please come up, and then afterwards we'll have a discussion, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Shannon, and um, thank you also, Michael, for inviting me to be a part of the Sitter Exhibition. It's really an honor. I was completely blown away by walking through the space, and um, being able to be in the same room with Nan Golden was just um, unbelievable. Um, I'm going to just show you a few images, and just for some context, um, not too many, I promise. Okay, so the body of work that is in the Sitter exhibition is called Double Life, and this project I've been working on since 2002. So what you see in um, each photograph is appears to look like one um, couple in a relationship, but it's really the same one figure seen twice. This was one of the first pictures that I made in the series. Um, it's called Giggle. It's the only one where she's wearing the same outfit twice. What I like about uh, the work is that it can be read down two different paths. On one path, it can be read about the self um, in relationship with different sides of the self. And on the other side, it can be read as a relationship between two different people. So throughout the series, I've really been pushing um, the body language and clothing and also gestures of my model. Um, here in this piece, this is called Brick House Cafe. We see her in a slightly more feminine pose on one side and then maybe a little bit more masculine on the other. Um, many people, when they are at an exhibition and see the work, they it usually takes them to, until they're about the fourth or fifth image and they're like, wait a minute. This may not be two different people. This could be the same person. And then they go look at it again with fresh eyes. And what I like about that process is that it shakes up their perception of what they saw from the very first image. Just like when we meet someone, we might have one impression of them. But over time, we learn um, that there's a lot more to them than that. So it's my hope that through this work, we can kind of shake up our definitions about identity and its fluidity. I hope none of you guys feel like this today. Um, this piece is called 4 AM. And um, I'll talk just to touch about my process. So for each image, I still shoot film. I shoot with a medium format 6-7 camera on a tripod. And um, my model will wear one outfit, and there's always a stand-in. Usually that stand-in's me, so I'll be wearing the other outfit. 
We'll shoot one to two rolls of film, go change clothes, come back, switch sides. I'll shoot another two, one or two rolls of film. And then after that, um, I get the film processed, make contact sheets or small prints. And then my favorite part of the whole process is making these small collages. So I figure out which one on the left will which work with which one on the right. And then after that, I scan those two negatives and then do the post-production work in Photoshop. Um, for me, I'm less interested in the technical aspects of the work. Photoshop just allows me to get to the meat of what I'm after. Um, I'm really interested in creating scenes that are quiet yet charged, whether it's a sexual tension or whether it's a psychological tension. Um, this piece is actually called Kitchen Tension, and it's about um, like that elephant in the room where you know both figures should be having a fight or talking about things, but neither one does anything. You can just feel that weight in the air. And you can't, it can't be ignored that my work um, appears to depict two women in a relationship. In many ways, my work does explore how relationship roles shift or remain the same when two females assume the roles as both partners. Most of the inspiration that I, um, that's behind my work is from lived experiences, but not all. So this is an example of one image where I got the idea for this photograph from watching um, a film. Christoph Kieslowski's French film, Blue. They're part of a series, red, white, blue. Maybe some of you guys have seen those. But in the blue um, movie, there's this great scene at the end where the male character comes back to tell the female character his true feelings for her. He's completely drenched. She's dry. And I could really relate to um, how I felt for both the female and the male character. And then sometimes um, my work is highly staged and choreographed, but I want it to look effortless and like it's documented. Um, most of the time, I know ahead of time everything. Like we spend a lot of times on the clothing, the props, the time of day, all of that. But we always pack extra clothes. And this is one example of an image that was taken on the fly with no planning. We were driving from one location to another, and it was actually in Denton, Texas, which is a really small town. And um, there was a small mall parking lot carnival, and we immediately turned around the car, parked, and then made this picture. Um, this one was a lot more challenging in post-production because the lighting had changed so much. Usually it's not that tricky in Photoshop with my work. Um, it doesn't take that long, but this one, because the sun was setting, there was quite a bit of work that I had to do to make it look believable. I often think that my photographs lie as documents, but tell truths as images. Because I did not document these two people or two selves at the same time and place, the image creates a fiction. But because my photographs portray inner thoughts and interpretations, vulnerabilities, and memories on a surface as a real object, a truth is created. This piece is called The Valley. And as um, Shannon mentioned, I've been working on this for a really long time. The first image was made in 2002, and I'm still working on this project. Um, this piece right here is called This Morning, and I feel like it's a picture that I could have only made after I, ha I had been in a long-term relationship for a long time. Um, the first pictures, like the ones at uh, the cafe, or there are some earlier ones where they're playing pool or drinking beer, they feel like more flirtatious and how uh, maybe when you just first meet someone. For me, this hug feels really fragile and uh, a hug that's through experience and um, a complex uh, time spent with someone over a longer period of time. This piece is called Head to Head. 
And then in some of the later images, I guess like 2010 to 2013, I was experimenting with um, darkness and what darkness could do with the images if I just had um, only hints of light come in. Like this one where her body's just slightly lit, you get the light of the um, drapes. There's a small outline of a photograph in the back and you might guess that they're in a hotel room and wonder what's going on there. And then this image where it's almost completely stripped of color. This one's called Dark Hour. And then the newest images, this, is the, this exhibition is the first time that this image has been shown in a few other ones. Um, this is called Sliding Doors. And in this in particular, I was interested in uh, really celebrating her body. Um, I just turned 40, so um, our bodies age whether we want them to or not. They're just going to keep aging. So I, um, I've been really fascinated with looking at how females are portrayed throughout art history and how many images, in photography especially, um, celebrate a young 20-year-old body. There's not that many women um, that have been celebrated in their 40s, 50s, 60s. I'm really excited to see John Copeland's self-portraits here, an older male body, nude, in an exhibition. That's really exciting. So this work is, uh, these images right here, some of them are celebrating her age. This piece is called Ascend. Lakeside. And then this last one is the field. Thank you. So I think what's uh, so spontaneous maybe a, a little bit about this panel discussion is this, even though Kelly and Doug live and work in Chicago, this is the first time they've actually met. Um, so this is a really intriguing conversation amongst two diverse practicing artists. Uh, my first question would probably uh, be to say that there's often this tendency in the arts or even in other disciplines to charge an artist who possesses various marginal identities, whether they be race or sex or gender, and who produces work in some sense that deals with those identities, uh, to flatten the work into an extension of that identity. So in other words, the work becomes an exercise in identity politics, no more or no less. And do you think it's fair that in this conversation, it's been framed under this banner of queer identity or um, provided a gloss of a certain preconceived politics in that? Or do you see your work in Sitter or your work or your practice as a whole as dealing specifically with queer identity or not? And if so, how or how not? And I guess I'll just address that to both of you. Um, yeah, I'm actually glad that you asked that. Um, I think that my work in particular has um, been framed under a um, queer category before. It's also been in shows that are just about portraiture, shows that were just about digital manipulation, um, shows that were about um, being gay, shows about relationships. So it has a few entry points there, but it is interesting to me when the work is um, framed under the identity of queer identity politics. Um, and for me, it does feel a little narrowing, but I think it's important to raise those questions and to talk about that. Um, it's a lot like feminism, actually, how that can feel so narrow, but really um, having the conversation can, can broaden that. Um, in my work, many people ask why I don't have uh, two different people play the characters. Why not just photograph two women so it's even more real? Um, but for me, that would be so specifically about a lesbian relationship or so specifically about the roles that just one person took on and maybe the other, that it wouldn't broaden it enough for me. And I've always been someone who has um, 
shied away from labels of any kind and uh, by having one model that can take on both roles of different sides of the self and different sides of the relationship um, I hope that that fluidity and those boundaries and those stereo stereotypes can be broadened um, so for me that's one thing that's important with the work well, I've been working a lot longer than Kelly. I'm a lot older than her. Um, and when I was trained, uh, when, when I did my graduate work at CalArts in the mid 80s, um, identity politics was a relatively new concept. And um, the work of mine that's included in Sitter was done um, in a very straightforwardly, uh, self-consciously, um, determined uh, sort of mode, I wanted to show um, gay men um, in social settings. Uh, there had been very little work like that done, and there still isn't very much work like that. Um, and I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to get the gay male body out of the studio, um, out from in front of a white sweep, and back into life. But um, as I've grown and worked, and my work has become, I think, more complicated and more, um, more layered in many ways, um, those concerns have kind of receded. I'm much more interested now in um, exploring uh, a whole range of identities and, um, and uh, relationships that um, don't flatten easily into um, into gayness or queerness or what have you. So um, I guess I'm I'm with Kelly in the sense that I um, I want my work to uh, to uh, to deal with the complexities of, li of life rather than uh, sort of simplifying and uh, streamlining things so that that um, the people the humans in my in my in my in my work. Um, fit neatly into some kind of minority category, so. I think <clears throat> that uh, filters ne nicely into my next question. I think you kind of answered part of it, but I'll go ahead and ask. Um, maybe if you have anything to add, Doug, you can start first. So you can look at your works in the exhibition in Sitter, and you can tell a particular narrative about the changing form of lesbian and gay or queer politics over the last few decades, not only within your own work, but a few other people in the exhibition as well. Um, like Nan Golden comes to mind, right? In, and in the 80s, uh, gay and lesbian politics, it, was, it seemed to be much more concerned with establishing visibility and a collective public presence or public politics that affirmed the possibilities of different ways of living. Uh, I think this is highlighted in your work and what you just said, right? About showing something that maybe not a lot of people had access to or kind of bringing it to the forefront and light with um, the gay beaches of Chicago. And um, now it's turned maybe a bit more, in some sense, inward or more individually focused. And I think, Kelly, your work for me seems to be a form of self-portraiture, first and foremost. And so I have always read it as such. Um, and how would you situate your work in context with this shifting terrain? What stories come to mind when you put both of your works together? You know, Doug, what does it mean to be next or in an exhibition with Kelly or Nan or even, I think John Copeland's is an interesting juxtaposition. And Kelly, I would ask the same of you. But maybe Doug, since you started talking about this already, it'd be great to have you answer first. Well, um, hmm. I'm, a, I'm having a little difficulty uh, um, jumping into in, in, into that exact 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 point in what you're what you're what you're talking about, but I'll try. Um, uh, the work in uh, in Sitter was um, done um, very much as a kind of conservation pro uh, project. Um, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic, and uh, I had lost a lot of friends to AIDS, and um, it seemed to me imperative, uh, crucial to document um, a subculture that I thought was in fact disappearing, that it was going to be 
wiped out and uh, what AIDS didn't kill off that the right would. Um, so I was kind of a man with a mission and I felt very, um, very passionately about what I was doing. Um, people have commented that there's no, there's no gloom, there are no, there are no uh, KS sores in the photographs and so on and so forth. But that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for signs of a kind of um, uh, uh, vivid, uh, invested public life. And one of the interesting things about the beach that I photographed at is that it's extremely central um, geographically in Chicago. So that you can't drive up Lakeshore Drive, which is one of the main traffic arteries um, in Chicago, without seeing this beach, without seeing these men. So it's a very much in your face kind of place. And that was incredibly important to me that people weren't hiding somewhere or weren't traveling to some suburban or, you know, Indiana Dunes beach to, uh, to be with each other. They were doing it right under the noses of um, the citizens of, citizens of Chicago. So um, when I see my work across from John Copeland's, you know, um, I'm both uh, honored because I have a, 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 a deep respect for what he did, and at the same time uh, feel myself um, uh, very, very, uh, very, very distinguished from him. Um, in that he was working from a place that had to do with age, I think, and the, um, the invisibility of age in this culture. And I was working with something that was, um, if not more pressing, at least more, um, more politically charged and more, um, more sort of uh, dire in its immediacy. So I don't know if I've answered your question at all, but yeah, anyways. Um. Just to add a little bit to that, I think a lot of the work or several um, artists chosen for the show do seem like the work chosen might be maybe not about the margins, but uh, giving um, giving a, a face or bringing out um, people who we wouldn't normally see, like Doug's 1980s work. And I also think about Katie Grannon's work on the boulevard. Um, and then um, even Natalie Crick's work photographing her mother, who is um, in her upper 50s. We're not used to seeing women of that age or that relationship being celebrated now. So it's a, um, I'm really excited that the exhibition has such the breadth that it does in its own definitions. And by having that um, breadth, it really opens some doors. Um, where I feel a kinship to seeing your films, um, maybe more so than the the documented works of the uh, men on the beaches, because that's such um, in a real, like really is bringing something real in, in front of us. Um, and my work looks real, but it's definitely fantasy. I think I feel more akin to your videos because they're so psychological and they, they create this tone. Um, and after you've watched the videos and have those um, snippets of repeating images and sound and um, the tone that you're left with, I can only hope that my work does that just a, a little bit because of the powerful psychological a aspects that that work brings. So thank you. Okay, uh, my last question for the evening, and then we'll open it up to you guys, is I agree with you, Kelly, that identity is something that's constantly in flux and multifaceted and shifting. And I think that's what I enjoy so much about your Double Life series, is that it allows for that and speaks to that. Um, we all carry various identities within us, right? And different identities become salient at different moments in time. And I think as photographers, our identities are interpolated through our work or in in ways named and unnamed and um, how do you think about who and what to photograph within your own practice 
and how has your subject changed during the course of your career? Um, does that change in the subject reflect any changes you've undergone as an artist or as a human? And does that change in the subject reflect changes in a broader world or even in the contemporary conversation of photography? So maybe Kelly, you could answer that first and then Doug. That's several questions. It is a lot of questions. <laughs> um, let's see here. So um, I think with Double Life in particular, that work, I've always been interested in the questions it raises and can ask back towards me. Like I feel like I learn a lot about my own life through what I'm showing. I know that sounds crazy, but um, it, it actually points back a lot to me through the process and I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I was discovering about myself. That's why I made this work um, at the time. So that work, because I've uh, been working on it so long, I'm able to question the different changes about the self and about relationships that we naturally go through over time. So. What's interesting to me is how I feel now in my 40s is very different than 10 years ago and when I'm in my 50s and 60s it'll keep changing. So I think that um, that can keep pointing back to me or keep raising some interesting questions. The newest work I'm working on now um, is a lot different than Double Life in that it's not constructed at all. It's actually um, straight portraiture and um, there are some landscapes in this work but this work um, it also has to do with relationships and identity but it is tied to um, following Edward Weston and Karis Wilson um, through different places that they traveled during the uh, Guggenheim years. He was the first photographer to receive a Guggenheim and they made this book called California in the West and she wrote all the text and he took all the images. So I'm, photo I'm traveling with my wife Betsy and we are making work in the places where they traveled and made work together. But that's a very different way of making work for me because double life is so constructed where I'm thinking about an invisible self that I take out or I'm removing myself. Um, the gaze is never met towards the viewer in um, double life. We're, voyeur we're voyeurs, we're able to watch them on a screen. They're always um, just in a, their own world. They never meet our gaze. So right now the challenge for me is to figure out um, what I want to say through the gaze back at the camera because when my wife looks at me if I'm removed then her gaze meets you the audience and it's a lot it's definitely um, been a really big interesting learning curve working in that way which is so different from how double life has been I don't know if I answered your question that was a long question <laughs> <so>. <laughs> No, but Doug, I guess to you. Yeah, um, uh, well, I'm uh, 66 years old, and over the last um, couple decades of working, I've become increasingly aware of the fact that, um, you know, I'm an older man. Um, there's no mistaking that and uh, no changing that. And uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm an artist working at a certain age in my life. So um, the, the last two films, for example, uh, deal with uh, my relationship, um, relationships with younger men in, on television or in cinema. And I'm very, very interested in the, the relationships that we can conjure um, from, uh, from a media, with, with media images. Um, and I think a lot of us do that, and many of us do that. We, we develop crushes on, um, on, uh, on people that are, uh, um, are, on, are on videotape, or um, you know, uh, they're a file um, in, a, in, a, in a Final Cut Pro uh, uh, timeline or something. And uh, I'm very uh, determined and very interested 
in uh, trying to figure out for myself and to share with my audience um, what um, it means to think, um, desire, um, uh, again, conjure as an older queer man. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, uh, sort of fascinated by that process and that prospect. Um, I don't think we've seen a lot of work done with this kind of um, self-consciousness or uh, um, sort of uh, uh, frankness about age and desire. Um, I think age and desire for the most part don't go together in the minds of people in this culture that um, older women in particular are seen as, you know, like um, one largely undesirable and certainly not as desiring subjects, um, which of course is bullshit. But, um, and older gay men are, um, especially uh, the men of my generation, which is, you know, um, dates back, back a ways, um, um, were expected to uh, sort of disappear into the woodwork over time and um, sort of get out of the way and not clutter up the world with um, aging bodies and, um, you know, uh, um, uh, sagging tits, you know. So uh, I'm... I'm, I'm wandering a little bit, but I'm very conscious in these films of, of being, you know, um, the desiring subject and being older and gazing, if you want to call it that, um, at younger men and uh, taking responsibility for that and having fun with that. So, um, I don't know, is that yeah, something? I, I don't <laughs> I think, you know, because you've been working the longest, your work seems to have changed the most. Sure. Right? Yeah. 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 And, um, so it's good to hear. I think it's a good time to open up the questions for the audience. So Palmer has a mic. We'll pass it around. Don't be shy. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Let's have some, let's, let's talk. Hi, um, I think with the exhibition with yours, I think it says Double Life, is it right? Um, I really appreciate like you doing that. Um, I took a different perspective from it because some of us who probably have a hard time uh, reaching out to other people to make friends and are not comfortable with ourselves and we have to keep changing ourselves to uh, be accepted by different individuals. Is that almost part of what your images are or is it something different besides the whole, um, sorry, I'm trying to put this in words. Oh no, you're, um, yeah, you're, you're right. So um, a lot of it does have to do with um, societal definitions about gender or identity and even um, how our society tells us how to dress, walk, talk, all that. So early on with the work, um, the first work was when, um, well, to be honest, I had been married before, and then I found myself really interested in women, and I look like the straightest woman alive, right? So I didn't know how to navigate if I was in the grocery store and saw some woman I was attracted to or wherever, how they would ever know that I was into them because I look so straight. I just do. So I would watch people and try to figure out this code to see if there was a code, to see if there was some, like, am I supposed to wear this, you know, wear certain clothes, walk a certain way, then would people realize that I was interested in them? So I was watching this. I w would just go out to gay bars or go um, try to try to decode this language. But in the end, anything I would have done would have been false to me. So I was really interested in broadening that definition, just how no matter what 
um, smaller sub-circle you're in, there's always some small code that you feel like you might have to, to take on that code or, or not. But um, that's where that work first started, was with that investigation in mind. Uh, this is a question for Kelly. Um, so you mentioned uh, intentionally using women who are older and not wanting to pollute the pool of already uh, young and attractive women and, and men as well. I just wanted to know what you think, I guess, how would you view your work and how would your audience view your work had you used uh, younger women in Double Life? Um, well, for, for me, it's the work is mostly about myself. Like when Shannon said that she sees it as a self-portrait, it's, um, it's primarily just mirroring back whatever I find out about myself. So the earliest ones were when my model was in her 20s. And um, for me, I don't feel like I can talk about what it's like to be in my 20s anymore. If I did, it would be what it's like to be your, in your 20s in the 90s. not like you guys that are in your 20s now. Um, and I'm just not as interested in that anymore as I am in what I'm realizing about myself now. And it also is um, kind of humorous that you brought up men, because I did try to work with um, just a male um, subject in a similar way with this doubled and it did not work at all because I don't understand what it's like to be a guy I won't I can't like um, it was just humorous and it actually pointed out more of our uh, stereotypes or what we may um, it wasn't genuine same thing with my model she um, actually was pregnant and had a little boy and um, in the early uh, I think it was 2004 2005 there's a whole series of those images where one figure is pregnant one figure is not but in the end I took all those out they're edited out from the project because I don't know what it's like to be pregnant I don't know I don't have anything that I want to comment on in a really true way and for me that work is all about my own truths and exploring that. So I guess that's the best way I can answer it is that um, I'm still interested in just using her as long as she's interested. And I'll probably just keep sticking with her throughout the whole project until either I get tired of the work or she's no longer interested in being the model. Hi, Doug. Thanks for coming to Columbus. <laughs> um, I just wanted to see if you would talk some about the sound. I was really startled, engaged, and confused by the music. Yeah, um, yeah. And I wanted to see if you could share with us how you came to those compositions. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, first of all, I'm an ex-musician, so I mean, I have this kind of like background. I'm, um, you know, I was a I was a professional cellist before I ever studied visual art. So. Um, um, I started. I took a photo one class when I was 33, so I'm a sort of late bloomer. But um, the music in the in the videos is uh, just as important as the as the image track, um, and the music is almost always chosen um, with an eye to its sort of conceptual. Uh, in the world. Um, uh, for example, the last film, the Tarzan film, um, the primary music that runs almost throughout the entire piece um, is a work by Sir, uh, Sir Edward Elgar, a, a British, co British composer, who was like the, you know, the, the, the kind of great composer, you know, the English are not such good composers, by the way, but um, the, uh, the you know the great composer of the uh, of the English Imperial Age, the British Imperial Age. So I knew I wanted to use that music because it fit perfectly, it seemed to me, with the Tarzan material, which is occurring occurring you know 
far, far away from the British Isles in uh, South Africa, um, and uh, uh, is, in a sense, the um, you know the uh, sort of the sort of inescapable musical trappings of uh, of English culture at that time. So that was very important to me. And it turns out that that work is a set of variations which um, Elgar, in which Elgar devoted a different variation to each of his friends, uh, to an another of his friends. So that uh, presented the, the sort of conceptual, conceptual possibility of dedicating sections of my film to friends as well, right? So, um, and uh, yeah, another musical source in that, in that film is uh, Felix Mendelssohn, the Song Without Words. And this was the sort of favorite, uh, among the favorite sort of parlor music of that age in England. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm always choosing music not only for what it sounds like and what it does emotionally, which is also incredibly, incredibly important to me, but also for its kind of place in the world culturally and, um, and uh, yeah, uh, how it fits, you know, into uh, uh, you know the sort of whole um, of of the pro of the work I'm building. So, in which piece? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that was, you know, that's, um, I mean, I, 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 you know, I've only been making films for maybe six or seven years, so um, even though that's quite a long time, um, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've come to filmmaking or video making uh, fairly late in life. You know, I worked as an installation artist primarily for, for many, many years um, after having worked as a photographer. But um, the um, collapsing Wall, frame walls in Alone With You um, were um, something I hit upon, you know, and I love, I've, one of the things I've discovered um, in, from make, filmmaking is that I am a geek, you know, I, I do love to fiddle with, uh, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the um, the tools and and effects in in Final Cut, for example, and um, and what I wanted to do with the floating frame walls was to both kind of enclose him and protect him, you know, but also entrap him, you know, and and uh, and limit him. You know. So um, it was a sort of double, you know, um, conceptual move for me. Um, it's uh, and I insist on those kinds of uh, uh, that kind of meaningfulness for the uh, for the techniques I, I I employ in my work. It, it's got to be about something. It can't just be there because it's attractive or um, you know uh, fascinating or what have you. It's it's got to be doing something for the meaning of the work. So. Hello, this message, or this question is actually for Kelly. And I was wondering if you could talk about your work in relationship to desire for companionship and relation, excuse me, relationships. And maybe the psychological component or element to that. Um, yeah, so the work is a lot about desire on one hand, um, and it is interesting that as an object, um, we, we also desire objects, so that's inherent to that. Um, but I think as the work goes on, it goes throughout stages of being about desire and then also about companionship, yes, about um, this um, friendship or twinning or a companion of the self um, and that has to do with being in a long-term relationship um, like you when you first are with someone or first meet someone there's a lot of desire and a lot of um, uh, 
like really craziness through, throughout the first year or two, maybe. But then it enters into another phase that's more about um, companionship, where there is there can be strong desire, for sure, but it's m turned into a, something else. And um, oftentimes it turns into one of being a companion. So um, that I'm interested in on the relationship side. And then also um, thinking about the sides of the self that we have. Um, I can't get away from, I can never escape the fact that she is always going to be uh, photograph if I present that. So um, that presentation will either be one of desire or many times some people look at the work and see one of um, companionship as well or friendship. Even sister, like a sisterly feeling towards each other. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Zachary and I wanted to know why do you choose to keep shooting with film? although you go in later and digitally alter it? Yeah, great question. Um, the, I'm, the truth is I'm just used to that format. Um, and the, I, my images, as you guys know, from the exhibition are printed really large. They're like three by four feet. So for me to shoot digitally, I would need a medium format digital camera, which they're extremely expensive. So as long as the there's labs in Chicago that will process film, then I'll probably still keep shooting film until I can afford one of those really high-end cameras. Um, I also love the latency of film. I like not knowing what I have, um, and this is just me. I've, I shoot digital on some other projects, but for that project in particular, because it's self-timed, I don't really like knowing what I get yet because we're interacting with each other. Like, I can feel like we're pushing ourselves in maybe a new way by not seeing what's there. And um, I think there's something really interesting about not knowing what I have until I get those three by five prints or the small contact sheets that I can physically cut up and make. So part of it's probably me just not letting go to a process that works really well for me. Um, but I think I'm also in love with that latency as well. Hi. Right here. Uh, this is a question for Kelly. Um, I was just curious about your decision to use a model instead of your own image since the work seems to pull from a very personal place and you do actually interact with the model uh, to get the images then you intentionally cut yourself out. I was curious about that decision and what you tell your model to have her relay that through your photographs and how you chose a model since this is such a committed relationship now. Thank, thanks for that question. Um, so the work that I did before this, um, a few years before that, was self-portraiture. Like I was really in love with self-portraiture. Um, for this work, I, as many of you guys know who have ever done any compositing in Photoshop, it's very difficult if you're trying to double yourself and have it look believable. Um, so. On a practical note, it was much easier for me to work with someone else. But the truth is, I'm not very good at acting, and I um, feel much more in line with a director. So Kiba is really great at acting. She's really good at taking um, my direction, and she's also really open to playing many different sides of herself in a much more believable way than I could. So for me, it's really important that I have her. And I actually met her in a photo class, just like you guys. I met her as undergrad photo students in a class in my junior year, years before we started this project. Um, I didn't know this project was going to turn into a long-term project. So years later, when I had the first idea for the first image, she just happened to be around. I knew I liked how she looked on film asked her to be in that um, small suite of pictures, and then it just started to evolve. Um, I think it helps that she understands photography. She really understands what it's like to um, work behind the camera and see it through that 
uh, frame. Oftentimes, once the scene is set up, I'll let her look through the viewfinder to see the edges, and she can really understand how to move within that frame. Um, but it's been really a joy working with her over time because that was something I didn't anticipate. I have a question for each one of you. Um, Kelly, to follow up on that, I wonder, it seems like the other long-term relationship that you're exploring is between director and subject or model and photographer. And I wonder if, if that's ever something you've thought about exploring with her. Or do you think that the project kind of implies that? Is that one of the layers? And then, Doug, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about the use of text in particular, um, those YouTube comments. There's some, it was, really fractured my sense of when all that was taking place. I think it, it's hard to f figure out when these films are mm -hmm. and, and how you think about text and, and how you're using it. Um, it seems like it had a lot to do with the music as well. there was a kind of a rupture that it allowed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you think about it, but those are my two questions. Do you want to answer the question first? You can go. Oh, okay, I'll go. Um, well, uh, you know, I, uh, I've worked with text for a long time, you know, in in uh, in uh, static uh, image text installations. So I, I have a lot of experience with it. But putting it on screen is um, is something really, really, really different. Um, I I feel the need to, um, you know, I mean, with, with just just about all cinematic elements that I work with, I want to move them. You know, in one one regard or another, I want them to. Um, um, I don't want them to sit still, either conceptually or physically. And um, the writing for uh, that I use in my films is often, you know, intentionally ambiguous. You know, it's it's hard to. It takes a while to sort of figure out what's going on with it. Um, in fact, for within the Tarzan film not until the credits at the end do you realize that you've been reading, you know, a text by Franz Fanon, you know, the great uh, um, uh, anti-colonialist theorist, you know, of the, of the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, that's really important to me, that there's a kind of mystery about, about the word, because I'm, uh, I'm extremely wary of um, the act of naming and the, uh, the specificity that comes with with language, and of course, I mean, we wouldn't be making films and photographs if we were content with language. You know, I mean, I think that uh, I, mean, I think that that's pretty pretty certain. Um, uh, I want the language in my films to uh, to confound uh, and not to uh, not necessarily to clarify. So, so if there's anything, any one element in in in, uh, in the sort of arsenal of, of, of um, cinematic uh, devices or materials uh, that I work with, um, that I can't uh, let. Uh, let be, you know, it's it's the text. You know. So, um, and of course, I'm always fighting the 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 the, the prospect of it seeming uh, contrived or gimmicky or what have you. You know, I mean, those are things that all of us, I think, especially people who are, you know, take on, you know, the uh, the you know the the uh, the, the opportunity of effects, you know. "Quote unquote," you know, um, in film, uh, are concerned about because I think I've already said this, but um, I don't want you know any aspect of what I'm doing to seem uh, um, uh, uh, to, to seem trivial or or um, or uh, predictable. So. Um, yeah, I, I could talk about specific exam examples, but that, that would take up too much time. But um, it, it's just that it, it's an element that needs um, constant, uh, um, uh, kind of constant prodding, you know, so it doesn't just sit there um, in any regard. So. 
And then your questions about directing as it relates to the new work. Oh, yeah. I think I'm always trying to push that aspect of the work because my, um, like any artist working on some project over a long period of time, you have to fight being redundant or following into the same um, uh, traps or uh, going down a similar path that you've already gone down. So um, I try to push myself both technically and how the work's made, and that is, uh, like the earlier works, typically have one figure on the left, one on the right. You can kind of splice it right down the center. And um, later, throughout the work, it's gotten more complicated formally, where sometimes they're at an X in the frame or they're physically hugging so much that it's really hard to um, think about doing that. So that's um, technically how it's done, but directing we have been trying to push the range of the work so that it could have higher highs and a lot lower lows. So um, pushing her in that way, we've tried crying scenes many times. This still has a hard time working to get a good crying scene. I mean, we've, we have tried onions, we've tried having her run outside, like su sweating, coming back all red, and we still haven't got a good crying one that I'm happy with. Um, we've gotten close, but that's one that we keep pushing. Um, humor is also challenging, I think, for me. And my normal personality is not one that is really funny either. So um, for me to pull off making a really great humorous picture that's not too sentimental in, uh, in the work has been a challenge too. So there are things that I'm trying to do to push how I'm directing her and what we do. Um, but as far as uh, the director also thinking about the scene and the cinematography, how the uh, props are used, everything that goes into that, I've really been trying to push that. Um, so stripping out all color and seeing what I could do with darkness and just directing in that space was really pretty interesting for me to see what I could come up with in that space as well. Yeah, I do. I think about that a lot because um, Kiba, my model, she actually gets so excited about this work. Like anytime um, I have the small collages together, she'll text every once in a while and say, do you have any new ones to show me? What's going on? And she, she I think, feels a creative release. Like it's her part of her practice to, to be the muse. Just like Sally Mann's oldest daughter, Jessie, talks about that a lot. And I think Karis, to some extent, felt the same way. She really liked the attention on her. It was her that laid on the dunes and rolled down and he happened to turn over and see her and take that picture and she enjoyed that. I think he's, uh, the pictures of her, many of them have been framed in a way that I'm not, that I'm now starting to see maybe they were framed incorrectly because she actually did like the attention on her and I know I'm seeing the work of her through a male's gaze and it's been written at uh, through that gaze so trying to figure out what I want to say in that work um, as a female artist photographing my wife and how I direct that that's the challenge I'm coming up against now Uh, hi, Doug. I was wondering if you could speak to how or why you are interested in the use of um, archived or appropriated footage in your films rather than going out and creating the footage on your own. Yeah, good question. Um, well, I have, the, I have this uh, very uh, strong conviction about uh, what a lot of people call appropriation, which is that um, uh, the work I use, the found 
footage or whatever you know, that I incorporate into my films is is not stuff that I've gone out and you know to, to a thrift store or something and found last week. You know, it's stuff that I've lived with for ages and ages and ages. And the VHS tape that figures in the wrestling film. Um, was something that I'd had for 25 years or something like that. And uh, and I say this quite openly, you know, um, I had jerked off to like hundreds of times, you know. So um, it's, it's stuff that I'm like intimately, you know, like uh, connected with. And I think that's one of the things that I hope di uh, differentiates um, some of what I do from what I'd call like sort of pictures generation appropriation uh, postmodern work um, uh, because I feel a lot of that work is is very kind of uh, dry and um, emotionally arid and uh, 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 kind of academic you know uh, scholastic I don't know what else to call it I mean I don't like it but um, but what what interests me um, this I'm trying not to sound too vain, you know, um, is that uh, with in my own practice, and I'm not, I hope it comes off. I'm not sure it does. Um, is that um, you know I I love the stuff I work with, and it's not only um, uh, it's not only that, but it's also the you know the the purely you know sort of literally physical kind of geogra geographical relationship I have to this material is that I've been around it for so long that I've absorbed it into myself, you know. It's been a long time in my own mind and heart and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, inner world, and um, now it's coming back out again, you know. And it's not coming back out the same way it went in, you know. It's coming back out in a radically shifted and, you know, sort of reconsidered way. So um, that's why I work with, with found, found materials. I mean, because they're, um, uh, and that's not may not always be the case either, but um, because I feel so deeply close to these things, uh, closer to them than I think I could feel to anything that I went out and shot, you know, because we have these, we, me and the wrestler, you know. Um, uh, have these long histories, you know, it's unrequited love, you know, he doesn't know about me, you know, but, um, and actually some of my friends wanted me to write him, you know, I don't know what I would have said, you know, like, uh, but, um, is, is that, yeah, I guess, I hope that's a pretty good answer, you know, I mean, it's, 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 I consider, um, you know, my use of found materials to be fundamentally different from uh, a, a lot of other people's. You know? and, I, and I talk about this really avidly with my students and, and I think it's a, it's a very important distinction. It also has to do with, with feeling for one's materials, you know, as one would feel for, you know, a model or, um, uh, or, or no longer really a model of muse and a, um, and, and, a, and, and a, almost a collaborator. But, um, and I think that's one of the things that's uh, uh, conspicuously missing from a lot of contemporary um, art is the felt, you know. It's, um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, cold, uh, clever work in the art world which doesn't interest me very much. So. Well, thank you both for coming and sharing so much with us this evening. And thank you guys for coming out on what was such a beautiful day today. Um, so. Thank you, Doug and Kelly.